Hi, this is Carl with the Archaeology Review. I first started creating this video just about a year ago after doing the Dendera Light video for Nick Barksdale and his channel The Study of Antiquity in the Middle Ages. To keep helping him out, it only seemed natural to follow up with the Baghdad Battery since they're both so often paired together anyway. Sadly, Nick took a turn for the worse and passed away before I could complete it. So I never did. About six months ago, Milo Rossi of the Minuteman channel put out a video of the Baghdad Battery, and as tempted as I was to watch it, I decided to hold off in case I ever wanted to finish this one and avoid being influenced. But before I could decide whether or not to finish it, Dr. Brad Hafford of the Artifactually Speaking channel did a response video to Milo's, which I did watch. Through Dr. Hafford's video, I discovered that I did indeed have a slightly different take on the subject than Milo, but I also got a few things wrong or incomplete. I'll link the Hafford video along with Milo's in the notes below. Be sure to watch them both for the full story, but I'm leaving my video as it is mostly because I think the parts that I miss are fairly small, and had things gone as planned, it would probably have come out right before Milo's, and it just doesn't feel right taking advantage of Dr. Hafford's expertise after the fact. In my last video, we discussed the Dendera Light, that symbol on five panels of the Temple of Hathor in Dendera, Egypt, that Eric von Doniken misrepresented as an ancient light bulb in his books and videos. A light bulb that would have existed thousands of years prior to its relatively recent invention. We talked about why it isn't a light bulb at all, but rather a representation of the rebirth of Harsumptus also known as Horus, on the day barge. We talked about how we know this through the texts on the walls with the images. Texts that von Doniken conveniently omitted from his books and from his videos. Today, I'd like to talk a little bit about a related artifact called the Baghdad Battery. Since von Doniken assumed the image represented a giant light bulb, he recognized that it had to have power, so he suggested that electricity did exist in antiquity in the form of the Baghdad battery, and that it was used to power lights, temples, and pyramids so workers, priests, and visitors could see in places closed off from the sun's light. But there are a few problems with von Doniken's power source. Even if we were to take the leap and assume the panels from the Temple of Hathor actually represented giant light bulbs, the Baghdad battery couldn't have been their source of power, and not for trivial reasons. So what is this Baghdad battery? Well, in 1936, in a small hilly district known as Kajut Rabua, on the outskirts of Baghdad in Iraq, a railroad was being constructed. While moving earth for the tracks, workers discovered the stone slab of an ancient burial. The Iraqi Antiquities Department was called in and they excavated over 600 artifacts like glass, ceramic vessels, beads, clay figurines, and bricks incised with curious symbols or characters. These were the artifacts of the Parthian period dating to around the second century of the current era. So sometimes they're referred to as the Parthian batteries which is probably more accurate since Baghdad didn't even exist yet. The artifacts arrived at the Iraq Museum in Baghdad. Wilhelm Koenig, head of the museum's conservation laboratory, began his examination. Within the assemblage from level F-4 stratum B were a set of artifacts collectively known today as the Baghdad Battery. Given the accession numbers 29209 through 29211, the artifacts included a ceramic jar, which was ovoid in shape, had a flat bottom, it stood about 140 millimeters tall, and was about 80 millimeters in diameter at its widest point. There was a tube of sheet copper, roughly formed, about 98 millimeters tall, 26 millimeters in diameter, and one end was closed off with a copper disc. There was also a rusted remnant of a pointed iron rod with fragments of natural bitumen, which was found around the top of the rusted iron rod and at the bottom of the copper tube. Now, I don't know if the tube and the rod were accessioned together if it, or if it was the rod with the bitumen, 
but there are four distinct groups of objects and only three accession numbers. The rod and the tube were apparently found as an assembly, which would have been kept from contact from each other by the natural bitumen collar. The copper tube was itself part of the jar's assemblage, also held in place by the bitumen collar. So how does this become a battery? Well, if you're like me, you had a pretty decent science teacher in elementary school and you did some pretty cool experiments like batteries made from lemons and potatoes. I think we even created a battery with vinegar once. Making batteries like this in school is fun, it's safe, and it's cheap. And they rely on the principle that different types of metals create different electrode potentials when immersed in an acidic electrolyte, such is the case with copper and iron dipped together but not touching in a weak acid like vinegar or wine, which may have been detected in the ceramic jar recovered at Kajut Rabua. Koenig was fascinated by this curious assemblage of materials and proposed that a set of these jars might produce sufficient voltage to be considered a voltaic pile, that is to say, a series of batteries with the bitumen acting as a seal for the weak liquid acid inside. But Koenig didn't jump to the conclusions of von Däniken and others of a more later period. People like von Däniken thought and still think that the Baghdad battery is an example of early high technology that is since lost to us, and that it powered large bulbs and darkened temples and tombs. Now, instead, Koenig assumed that the device was one used for electroplating, which seemed like a logical assumption. And several other similar artifact assemblages were also found in the region. Koenig supposed that a gold cyanide solution or even salt water were possible electrolytes, and others suggested acetic acid or citric acids like vinegar or lemon juice were used. Unfortunately for Koenig and others who favored the electroplating hypothesis, it seems unlikely to be the answer. The reason is that a method to create an aqueous solution of metals like gold or silver wasn't known in this time. This really makes electroplating no more likely than powering a light or a radio. The technology necessary just didn't exist. At least, there's no evidence for such materials in the archaeological record. Other methods, however, of gilding gold or applying silver to a base metal have been found. These involved surface leaching, pickling, and just plain dipping objects in molten silver chloride. One method of gilding, the application of gold to materials like wood, ceramic, and other metals, was to dip the object in a molten amalgam of mercury and gold and then heat the object until the mercury evaporated. This was a dangerous process, but one that is well represented in the archaeology of many ancient cultures. Processes like the gold mercury amalgam are extensively detailed in the literature of the period. However, if we assume the purpose of the vessels, like the ones Koenig was looking at, were for electroplating, the methods to create aqueous solutions of gold or silver are curiously absent. These processes weren't used until the last half of the 19th century. But even if the Baghdad batteries were intended for electroplating, and some residue of the metal solution should be found in the jars if they were, these small jars would be inefficient compared to other methods of combining precious metals to lesser ones. The reason is for their size, to be sure, but experiments show that the power obtained from Various electrolytes barely rise to half a volt, say 0.4 to 0.49 volts. And the iron rods depolarize after just a few hours as copper accumulates on the rod. That is to say, the electrodes just wear out quickly. So what were these curious little jars really used for? A half a volt really isn't enough to electroplate or even efficiently power a light. Okay, so a small LED which was invented in 1962, takes about 1.8 to 3 volts and a few milliampers to light it. On the Instructables website, a DIY project site that I recommend, someone tried to duplicate the Baghdad battery experimentally and concluded that they were ultimately able 
to get a few volts of electricity at around 33 milliamps per hour of capacity after three days of charging. Enough to light up an LED for a short period of time. Mythbusters also explored the Baghdad battery during an episode in March of 2005. They created 10 handmade terracotta jars, filled them with lemon juice, used copper and iron for the reaction, and only produced about 4 volts. And as archaeologist Ken Fader pointed out, there is no archaeological evidence that these jars were ever configured to be set up for batteries, either in series or parallel. In other words, there's no evidence that the jars were hooked together to increase voltage and amperage the way the Mythbusters did, or even that they could be hooked together. So when we look at them as batteries or a power source for electroplating, these notions become unlikely. The voltages just aren't sufficient, and electroplating has its own problems with the lack of aqueous metals to work with. These are use cases of technology getting ahead of itself, as practical applications aren't present in the archaeological record until much later. So, how do we answer the mystery of these silly little jars? In 1989, Dr. Emirik Pastori, a chemical engineer at Host AG in Germany, had the same question. Pastori, with an interest in ancient chemistry of Egypt and the Near East, wrote a short chapter in a book on the role of metals in the history of technology. This is a really cool book, and I'm going to link to it in the description below. First, he looked at the question of electroplating and arrived at many of the same conclusions we already discussed. Methods of galvanizing a gold anode into a solution just didn't exist either in the archaeological record or in the literature of the time. He did, however, find one method that was hypothetically available to early alchemists and metallurgists, which involved the use of potassium gold cyanide to get the gold into a solution. But the design of the Parthian vessels just didn't work. The enclosed copper cylinder, characteristic of these artifacts, at once brings the process to a standstill. Pastori goes into a lot more detail on this and other methods and why they didn't work. So his chapter is a must read if you're really interested in the Baghdad batteries. But here's the part I really found interesting. In the next page and a half, Pastori introduces the idea of magical thinking in Mesopotamia and how it was so prevalent during the Parthian and Sasanian periods. Here's a quote. Belief in the effectiveness of magic rested on the idea that the cosmos formed a unity. All of the elements of the universe, from the gods on high to the demons with bodies of ether, air, and water, to the planets and stars, then to human beings, animals, and plants, down to the inanimate matter such as stones and metals, were connected to each other. The magical force at work could be transferred through a chain of links bound together by the agency of sympathy up to the appropriate divine being. The demons who occupied an intermediary position between the gods and mankind were accessible to human beings. A distinction was drawn between the so-called pneumatic demons, who were in the service of the gods, and the demons, usually harmful, who were held more strongly by the spell of matter. A person could exercise power over them if he possessed knowledge of the chain of sympathy. For instance, which substance was in mutual action with which demon or divinity. He goes on to discuss how ancient Mesopotamians viewed certain metals in connection with demons and magic, citing the literature of various ancient Near Eastern texts. And he relates how people of the time consulted with specialists in magic or sorcery to apply spells for protection or even curses against an enemy. Part of the process was a combination of understanding the inherent magical force of things like iron nails and the materials that spells were actually written on, like papyrus, silk, gold, parchment, or for curses, lead. Rolled up and tied with threads, spells for things like protection could be placed inside a metal container that could be worn or deposited inside a vessel. The first of these clay pots was found in the Parthian strata at modern Kajut Rabua, not far from Baghdad, and they were found in association with what was determined to be magical bowls. 
Pastori describes a total of 12 of these curious little clay pots, including the one from Kajut Rabua. Four were found across the Tigris in Seleucian deposits and in association with metal rods, one of iron and the rest of bronze. Also found were bronze cylinders that presumably contained papyrus rolls. Three jars were found lying on their sides, but one was found upright and contained shards of a glass bottle. These Seleucian finds were excavated in 1930 by the University of Michigan. Right around the same time, German archaeologists were uncovering six more in Catesavonstrata just across the river. They were all sealed in unglazed pots of clay from 7 to 22 centimeters tall. Contained within these pots were rolled up bronze sheets sealed at either end with bitumen and bronze scrolls. Some of the bitumen sealed rolls had fibrous materials within them, ostensibly papyrus or parchment. Some of the places these jars had been found were variously described as cult houses or magicians or sorcerers buildings, or maybe they were just the homes of regular people wanting to protect themselves from evil. So they're not intentionally used for the generation of electricity, but they're probably intended to be used for spells, conjurations, curses, or blessings by initiates of protective or sometimes harmful magic on behalf of themselves or others. Or so the ancient Mesopotamians appeared to believe. Hey, this is still an assumption, and maybe even something of a guess. But it's an educated one based on the evidence available through the archaeological assemblages, ancient literature, and experimentation. Regardless, the Parthian jars found thousands of miles from the Temple of Dendera in Egypt would certainly not have powered lights that we now know are actually representations of Harsumptus emerging from a lotus blossom on a barge. If you think about it, the true natures of these so-called Dendera lights and the Baghdad batteries are way cooler than Von Donikin's propositions. I really enjoyed reading about the story of rebirth and renewal using the day barge and the lotus blossom and Dendera. And if you haven't already seen that video, check the link in the description below or click the thumbnail at the end of this video. And I find the magical beliefs of ancient Mesopotamians completely fascinating. If you want to read more about either of these, I'm including some Amazon links in the video description below. If you decide to buy any of these books through the affiliate links, I'll get a few pennies on the side, which eventually will let me buy a book of my own. So if you like the video and you want to see some more, give me a thumbs up and subscribe. I've got a lot of interesting ideas for future videos. There are a lot of fringe ideas out there where I think the truth is way cooler than the stories that were created around them. Some of them are just misunderstood artifacts like the Parthian jars. Some of them are outright hoaxes and they're fascinating all to themselves. But they all have stories. Oh, and don't forget, check out the channel that inspired me. The Study of Antiquity in the Middle Ages. There are over 400 videos of interviews and discussions of ancient civilizations that were curated by Nick Barksdale. If you're not a subscriber, you should be. I guarantee there's something there that will appeal to you. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.